Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast. Before we begin our lengthy exploration of Asian horror films released in 2004, I'd like to first take a look at production and availability of the surrounding years. I think this data is particularly interesting because you can see the trends in the overall production in this industry. Now, of course, I have not seen every Asian horror film, but I try to watch as many horror films that I can find that were theatrically released in their home countries, with some direct-to-video selections peppered in here and there. Therefore, my personal viewing totals will at least give us some basic idea of how many films were produced and available for each year. And, you know, these numbers for uh, future years might be, they, they might change slightly, when we get to future videos as I watch more horror movies and uh, or reclassify certain titles as horror or non-horror. So here are my totals just to give you an idea. So 1998 I saw 13 Asian horror movies from that year. 1999, 19. 2000, 21. 2001, 19. 2002, 18. 2003, 25, 2004, 42, 2005, 48, 2006, 43, 2007, 40, 2008, 36, 2009, 30, 2010, 36, 2011, 24 and 2012 31 let's add 2013 in there too 34 and I hope that number goes up as I watch more from that year so you can see the increase in availability of Asian horror films in the West from 2004 through the present day compared to years previously with every single year contributing about 30 films to watch with the exception of 2011 uh, which was kind of a uh, I guess a small downturn in the overall availability from what I've seen so far. So before 2004, just to give us some perspective, I had not seen 30 Asian horror films from any one previous year, going all the way back to, of course, you know, 1926 when we started this playlist. So it's pretty interesting there with the, uh, you know, when I mentioned in a previous video that the, I guess, explosion of Asian horror availability in the West took a little bit of time after Ringu was released in 98. You know, it didn't really hit until 2004. So, I, I kind of like that data analysis. It's pretty interesting, because I had not noticed that myself until after I actually looked at all my, uh, my viewings and what years they were from. Now, as we all know, however, quantity does not necessarily signify quality, right? So what if this increase in production resulted in a plethora of worthless garbage? You know, uh, what if the overall quality of Asian horror dropped significantly during this time period? But if that were the case, then the increase in production could be considered detrimental to the industry. But, most fortunately, the overall quality and entertainment value of these films actually improved slightly with the increase in production, in my opinion. So from my personal experience... I actually enjoyed a slightly higher percentage of films from 2004 and subsequent years when compared to 1998 through 2003. So if you couple this with the explosion in production, this resulted in a significantly higher number of entertaining films to watch during each year in this time period, as well as a number of all-time classics for the genre. So what about 2004 specifically as an example here? Well, I'll definitely... Uh, it's definitely an improvement over 2003 in terms of overall quality. So remember, as I covered in my last few videos, I saw 25 Asian horror films from 2003, 17 of which I did not like. Now comparatively, I saw 42 Asian horror films from 2004, only 15 of which I did not like. So despite the jump in production, you actually have a decrease in the number of fail grade films, based on my personal ratings, of course. So instead of 8 enjoyable Asian horror films from 2003, I enjoyed 27 Asian horror films from 2004. That's a pretty big upgrade if you're a fan of Asian horror and you want to watch a lot of uh, pretty interesting films each year. 
and a handful of these films for 2004 are actually newer classics. So this is, this is exactly the kind of development in the industry that you want to see. In fact, there are probably a bunch of movies that I rate as middle of the pack for 2004 that you might love. And I actually know a lot of people on the internet, uh, in fact, who do love some of these films that I rate kind of middle of the pack for 2004. So there's a lot of good stuff, uh, interesting stuff to go through in this year. Now, in this Asian Horror Year in Review playlist, I have never needed more than two videos to cover any one particular year in this industry, but that's changing now. So we will probably need four videos to finish our coverage of 2004. So let's get started here. We'll discuss honorable mentions in the next video. And remember, titles for all of the movies I discuss are listed in the description box below. So we begin with the worst Asian horror film from 2004, again out of 42 titles. Now I must admit that there was a moment of hesitation when I decided to grant that prestigious award to this particular film, mostly because the first time I saw it, it was an astonishing experience. This movie is so bad, it's historic. Most, uh, but not historic like Die Covery that we covered from 2003, which was historic for its complete lack of quality. Oh no, no. This film from 2004 is historic for two reasons. Number one, its complete lack of quality. And number two, its sheer insanity and randomness. This movie is so random, it's unintentionally hilarious. But with that said, I rewatched it earlier this year and it was more painful to sit through because I knew what was coming. So yes, I am fairly confident now in this pick for the worst Asian horror film from 2004, and that is Marine. I think I'm pronouncing that right. A Japanese horror film. All right, so a girl named Marino, no relation to Dan, loves her Marine doll that was unfortunately made by a demented genius who uses a diabolical machine to turn human beings into wax dolls. Now his assistant is even more insane than he is and takes fancy to this girl. He begins to stalk her, and when that isn't enough, he takes her and her friends prisoner, plunging them into a dream world of living dolls. Man, that's a fantastic premise for a film, isn't it? But what an utterly incompetent film this is. Just the execution in general is just horrible. This film is bad from minute one, where it gets very cheesy in a B-movie sort of way. This one has like blown up dolls okay I think I can't remember if they were blow up dolls or actual kind of mannequins I think it has both if I remember correctly horrible acting the acting is just terrible some fast forward photography that's wasted on a toothbrushing scene don't ask and an apt soundtrack and a boatload of completely random events now, there are more stupid scenes in the first 15 minutes of this movie than most horror films can fit in 90 minutes. In one unintentionally hilarious scene, a girl sees a missing woman on television and comes to the startling revelation that the, woman, the woman's picture on the television looks exactly like her doll. The film then pans to show the doll, which looks nothing like the missing woman on television, in another scene, a madman explains, scientifically, how he turned the women into dolls. Quote, the pond turned them into wax, unquote. Later on in the film, he also explains how he turned the women into dolls a second time, and the explanation is completely different from the pond just turned them into dolls. Now, it would literally take a dissertation to describe all of the side-splitting idiocy that exists in this film. The editing is among the worst I've ever seen, which assists the randomness of everything, of course, because the editing seems to be random. The production values and cinematography are completely worthless. This one is a special film, but for all the wrong reasons. However, this is one of the few really bad Asian horror films that you may want to check out because uh, its awfulness is portrayed in such a glorious manner. 
there are so many WTF moments that your only response is to shake your head in complete disbelief. But I must warn you, this is not a so-bad-it's-good movie per se. Even though it does have a few scenes that qualify as such, I, this film really is painful to sit through. So, yeah, this one is really bad. So, of course, I do not recommend it. Let's move on. And our second film tonight is called Tokyo Psycho. From Japan again. In this film, a girl gets stalked by a sadistic freak. So, the beautiful owner of a design agency finds her life disrupted when she receives paper scraps stitched together with piano wire with the message, I know you were meant to marry me. As further messages arrive, she embarks on a nightmare investigation to uncover the identity of her tormentor. Now, unfortunately, this movie shifts back and forth between being boring and being annoying. The antagonist is not scary or interesting. He's just obnoxious. The acting is either too stiff or too exaggerated. Production values are terrible. This is basically like a micro-budget micro crap fest, devoid of any imagination or effort. It was directed by a man named Ataru Oikawa, the same man who gave us the first film in the Tomie franchise, which was good. Unfortunately, most of this guy's other films were just not good at all, and he's not a director that's worthy of an extensive filmography exploration, so to speak. So, yeah, Tokyo Psycho, not a good flick. I watched this one way back in the day, and I've never really gotten the urge to give it a second chance. Skip it. Let's move on here. We, we move on to a different country. We move to Thailand for The Commitment, Thai horror film. Okay, here's, here's the plot synopsis for you. Did you ever wish with all of your heart to achieve some apparently un unattainable goal? A group of high school graduates do just that, embarking on a terrible journey into the unknown. Pushed by peer and parental pressure, they visit a mysterious shrine offering gifts to a vengeful ghost and pledge their souls rather than fail their entrance exams into a prestigious universities. Their desires are met, but at a grim price, of course. The hateful spirit has some wishes of her own, and her demonic demands lead to a trail of doom and despair. Now this overall is just an amateurish, limp movie with underwhelming acting and a poor script that carries no momentum for the story. It's rather clunky, actually, in how things develop. The scare scenes are poorly realized and very cheesy, and they use very generic tactics as you've seen in other Asian horror films, and horror films in general. The odd thing, though, is that the camera shots immediately before the scare tactics are actually pretty good, at least in terms of framing. Some of the shots here are actually pretty nice to see, uh, but that's one of the few pos positives that I can remember for this one. Uh, not one to seek out, I think. Very generic and... Just not worth it. Skip it. All right, the next one here is one in a film series that we will be covering here. And uh, that is Death Train from Japan. After a train wreck, three schoolgirls experience hellish events. So these girls are all set to enjoy their day off. Uh, Yukino, Asako, and Natsu are their names. So they board a seemingly normal train. Then suddenly, a deafening sound and a flash of light envelop them. But the three arrive at school the next day as if nothing happened, almost like a time uh, distortion. And yet, something is also not right. They see oddly familiar faces, their families are out of sync, and they are chased by strange men in black. Plagued by these nightmarish sensations, our girl Yukino flees only to find herself in front of an amusement park they were headed to on the fateful train ride. Uh, she basically comes to the strange realization that they're stuck between nightmare and reality, between the walls of two worlds that are closing in on them. So this film begins with a narrated introduction that I actually enjoyed, because it has an old-school horror series feel to it, almost like uh, when the Crypt Keeper comes out for the Tales from the Crypt uh, show. But this, uh, this narrator is a lot cheesier than the Crypt uh, Keeper was. So, but I still kind of liked it. 
just kind of an old school kind of spooky vibe. The primary goal for this film here is to establish almost like a surrealistic experience using some unexplained phenomena uh, like disorientation. Uh, some leprosy is, is tucked in, some zombies and corpses within kind of an alternate dimension type setup. There is some creative stuff here. Uh, there is. But again, the execution just not very good. Most of the scenes will provoke eye rolling or unintentional giggles. With that said, though, I did enjoy the finale, which was very unique and a bit creepy, actually. Most surprisingly, though, the short runtime of only 61 minutes really doesn't help matters much, because the pacing is still glacial despite the uh, short runtime. And overall, this is really a boring movie to watch. I rewatched this one just this past week, just to. I don't know, because I read my synopsis, I'm like, you know, this sounds like an interesting flick, I should give it a second chance, but uh, it, it, uh, it stayed on the same rating levels I remember previously, just not good. This is actually uh, one of six films in the Hideshi Hino Theater of Horror series. They're basically a series of films, and uh, we will cover the other five films in this series in this Asian Horror Year in Review playlist, three of which were also released in 2004, so, uh, you know, those other three are thankfully a little better than this one. Can any of those three actually make it to recommendable status? Well, we'll have to stay tuned to find out. Now, the next film here on our list is one that probably a lot of people have seen, and that is Dark Tales of Japan, of course, a Japanese horror anthology. Now, this anthology has five short stories. I don't remember too much about this one, so let's just cover these stories briefly, shall we? So the first one is The Spider Woman. A tabloid reporter is selling a lot of magazines by reporting on numerous, unconfirmed reports of a lady who is half-spider, who has been terrorizing suburban roads at night. Now this one is slow-paced and mostly forgettable, despite a few bits of effective comedy. The big finale is... it's merely okay. All right, the second short film here is called Crevices. Uh, a man's friend disappeared without a trace, so he visits his friend's apartment, but he is shocked by what he finds there. Now, this segment is actually pretty good, with a brief finale that works well. The third film here is The Sacrifice. Mayu has a problem with a stalker at her workplace. She hurries home to care for her mother, but finds her mother chanting a strange sutra. Since then, she gets a strange mark on her hand, and uh, some weird stuff happens. So, this is merely decent, with an oddball ending that's, that's okay. You know, really nothing here to see. I didn't really like the third one very much. The fourth one, Blonde Quieten, is probably the weakest of this whole uh, anthology. Uh, Yoshio stays in his friend's home, alone in Los Angeles, of all places, he falls asleep, but is aroused suddenly in his slumber. I remember this one being really lame. I mean, really lame. It has a boring setup and a really pathetic payoff. This one is just bad. Did not like it at all. And finally, we have Presentiment, the final story here. A man steals sensitive data from his employer and becomes trapped in an elevator with three other people only he can see. Overall, mediocre stuff. I think there's one popular actor in this one, but uh, he doesn't really add much. So this anthology is, you know, I wouldn't say it's terrible per se, even though one or two of them could be described as such, but it's, uh, it's not really worth watching. And I know many of you out there have probably seen this, and maybe a few of them, a few of the segments maybe you liked, a few you didn't, so feel free to let me know in the, in the uh, comments section. I'm kind of interested to see what, uh, what segments, if any, you enjoyed. Uh, this is actually really disappointing given the fact that we have covered and will cover many more Asian horror anthologies that are better than this one. Overall, I think the Asian horror film industry, industry does a good job with anthologies, with the exception of a few uh, disappointing franchises like, of course, Troublesome Night and Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Most of the other stuff is pretty good, though. Another odd thing is that these short films are directed by some big-time horror directors, you got Takashi Shimitsu from, of course, the Juon franchise. You got Norio Surata from the Ring Zero. You got Koji Shiraishi, who is a personal favorite of mine, who we will cover later 
in this playlist actually is at least one film from this year, and Masayuki Ochii, who directed The Hypnotist. So a lot of talent here, but it just didn't didn't come through. Uh, not their best work. Does not represent their best work. So I do not rep re recommend the Dark Tales of Japan. All right, so now we shift to a film that is lesser known. We go from a well-known one to a lesser known one. And that is Unplugging Nightmare, also known as Unplugged Nightmare, a Hong Kong horror film. Now, a woman attempts to solve the mystery of the recurring nightmare she's had since childhood, which involves a creepy house and an old woman in a chair. Now, she's lived with this problem for years, but nowadays it's causing horrific visions during the daytime, so she's got to... She's gotta, uh, find a cure or something to this thing because it's really affecting her life. All right, so I'll get to a few positives here. The camera work and the soft lighting are nice. I also like the music. Uh, this movie uses a lot of runtime to show the psychological stress placed on the female lead who tries to figure out if her dreams are fiction or fragments of her lost past or something else. So, you know, that's kind of a good thing. I like that. The problem, though, is that there isn't enough content to drive this this film from start to finish, you know, throughout the, the whole runtime. There's childish quibbles between her and her boyfriend that are not handled properly, and the ending is unsatisfactory and uh, just uh, not very impressive. The overall concept is pretty good, but execution is off, so I do not recommend this one. You could skip it. The next one is another one that isn't that well known, but we're back in Japan this time, and that is Surubo Nogara, Japanese horror film. After a catastrophe, a nurse and a man with a bizarre contraption attached to his back regain consciousness but are trapped in a wrecked hospital room. So while the woman tries desperately to escape, the man experiences an inner struggle on the borderline of dream and reality. So... This is a low-budget, slow-paced, and minimalistic film. In theory, that could be a good thing or a not-so-good thing. And in this case, it's unfortunately not so good. It does have some interesting images at times, but overall, it's rather boring and forgettable. Some websites have actually classified this as a Japanese cyberpunk film. I think it lacks enough of those elements to be classified as such. I mean, Japanese cyberpunk films are usually... Uh, they usually incorporate some very fantastic images that sear themselves like into your brain. You know, think Tetsuo the Iron Man is, is an obvious one, or Rubber's Lover, which we previously covered. But uh, Suburo Nogara, on the other hand, it fails to make an impression. It doesn't really incorporate cyberpunk elements all that much. But, uh, you know, so if you're a fan of cyberpunk horror... I don't really think that's a reason for you to check this one out because those elements are don't come through very strongly. Do not recommend it. So the next film here is one that uh, you know I've seen some pretty bad reviews of online. I can understand why. I can understand why, and that is Mail, a Japanese horror drama. Now. In this film, a paranormal investigator dispatches ghosts with a purified gun while attempting to come to terms with his past. Now, much of the first half of this movie follows our protagonist as he goes about his ghost-busting tasks. So, for example, he receives a letter from someone who needs help with getting rid of a ghost inside a painting, so he goes and uh, dispatches of the ghost as necessary. Unfortunately, the horror during these segments is mediocre and does not mesh too well with the drama. Just, uh, I don't know, I just found this film to be awkward a little bit. Also, the CGI is hor horrible. <laughs> it's bad. However, the most well-made portion of this movie lies in the latter half when the dramatic elements are introduced via childhood flashbacks. And Chiaki Kuriyama provides... A charming supporting role in this. Uh, and of course, Chiaki was the girl who played uh, Gogo in Kill Bill, and uh, she was in Battle Royal and a bunch of other flicks. So it was, that's the whole reason I actually watched this movie back in the day, just because she was in it. And she's the best part of this movie, 
but it's not enough to to make this recommendable, you know? So Mail is a mediocre experience overall. Now next year, we have yet another installment in the Hideshi Hino Theater of Horror. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, that's that's wrong. I moved that film to a to a different a different segment in the next video because I rewatched it and it was actually pretty good. So stay tuned for that. That was a little uh, unintentional niblet for you to to look forward to on our next video. All right. So we got instead a Filipino horror film, and uh, that is Pasiam. So after their mother's death, her adult children gather in her, in their family home to respect the funeral rite of Pasiam, uh, a nine day mourning. Now. Unfortunately for them, there seems to be something sinister within the house. Now, this film is obscure, but virtually every review I've read online gives it a glowing review. It took me a while to see it. I think it was posted on YouTube, and it still might be. Uh, but ultimately, this one disappointed me. This has a very familiar premise, as you could have guessed from the synopsis I gave. But... You know, the slow pacing does help to build some atmosphere, and it does avoid some cheap jump scares, which I'm, I'm always appreciative of. Too many cheap jump scares gets on my nerves, so this doesn't have too many of them, so that's good. But those are basically the positives. The acting is, you know, not particularly good. The horror scenes are not well executed or memorable. I found the big finale in particular to be very poorly directed, shot, and edited. It was way too dark, and the images were just very messy. When you're watching the film, it just it was a very messy uh, finale. Did not like it at all. The story is also rather dull overall and lacking in dramatic impact. Uh, not a terrible film by any means, but uh, just run-of-the-mill stuff. There's a lot better haunted house kind of movies that are out there, especially from Asian countries, even the Philippines, which... We have covered in the past, and we'll definitely get to in the future. So, unfortunately, I can't recommend this. And it was a disappointment because a few reviews I read online really talked this one up. So, now we have looks like one movie left for this video here. And it's one that's a bit weird, weird title and a weird film, and that is Elevator: The Bottled Fools, a Japanese kind of cyberpunk horror film. Now, taking place in a strange underground world of the future, possibly run by a police state that oppresses the people, at least that was the impression I got, a psychic schoolgirl and some random passengers, which include two prisoners, get trapped inside of an elevator, after which violence ensues. Now, this is an interesting idea with the psychic angle, uh, but it's basically gone to waste here. This does have some creativity to it, but much of it is inept. Uh, the psychic, psychic theme provides a lot of potential, of course, uh, in terms of providing backstories to all the characters, because that would be a really interesting scenario if you had people, I guess, that lied to one another, but the psychic girl kind of uh, obtains pieces of information throughout the film regarding their past and who they really are and what they've really done. You know what I mean? And it does kind of do that, but uh, it's very superficial and not particularly interesting. You know, this is almost like a film that should be character-based, but the characters are very thin, and that hurts it. Script is actually very juvenile and simple-minded, and I remember being annoyed multiple times while watching this. It's kind of an obnoxious film. There are some gruesome deaths to enjoy, if you like that kind of thing, but for my, in my opinion, it's not enough to uh, lift this film to a pass grade, so yeah, cannot recommend it. So that was our initial dive into the lesser Asian horror films from 2004. Now part two of this video will begin with a few more underwhelming films, but will mostly include uh, some films that I enjoyed. So make sure you look out for that. There will actually, next video is going to be interesting because you have a few more underwhelming films. And then some of the films that I enjoyed are pretty controversial because a lot of those give some pretty bad reviews too. So it'll, it'll be a fun video for sure. And uh, as always, we'll see you next time.